my paper today is low energy alternative for biosolids of watering, and specifically we're talking about the screw presses. How much is a check for? So as I go through the, uh, the presentation, I'll review some of the legacy watering technologies we're already familiar with, bell press and centrifuges, just to get everybody baseline of the technologies. Uh, I'll talk about some of the key components and features of screw presses and what makes a screw press a high performance screw press. Uh, touch on the daily operating and maintenance procedures required for the technology and then circle back around some comparative costs comparing screw presses to belt presses and, and centrifuges from a capital operating and, and maintenance standpoint. Uh, here's a, a graphical representation of a belt filter press. Many of you are probably already familiar with it. Sludge gets flocculated with a polymer system, goes across a, pulls across a gravity uh, thickening zone before getting sandwiched between two filter belts and passing over a series of rollers. Now these rollers you know, typically get larger in diameter so you can get additional uh, compression on the cake. Discharge a dewatered cake off the uh, end of the press and then the belts pass through a wash zone to clean the, uh, the, the belts and then it just loops, whoop, loops back around to uh, start the process again. A belt filter press has been around a long time, a lot of pros and cons. Some of the cons include that they uh, have a high wash water usage, got a, a large footprint, the largest footprint of the technology that we'll look at today, relatively high power usage with uh, the wash pumps and driving the belts. Uh, it's an open machine design, so you've got odor control issues and sometimes some housekeeping issues. Uh, a lot of mechanical points to service with all the different rollers. Uh, if you're budgeting from a maintenance standpoint, you can expect maybe up to 15% of what you spent on that machine per year in, uh, in spare parts costs. Uh, another technology we'll look at today, the belt filter presses generally produce the lowest cake solids uh, compared to the, the screw presses and centrifuges. But on the plus side, belts typically have the lowest polymer consumption and they are quite easy to operate. Centrifuges, again, would have similar uh, sludge prep system with polymer systems being fed in through the the scroll inside of a, a larger bowl that's operating at really high RPMs, 3,000, 4,000 RPMs. The centrifugal force is separating the solids, driving them forward while the filtrate is returned out the back side of the machine. Uh, Dewater cake discharge off this side. From a pro and con standpoint, centrifuges have extremely high power usage, generally measured in, a, in over 100 horsepower. Uh, maintenance because of the high RPMs. Generally expect about 30% of your machine costs per year for maintenance. They have high polymer usage because of the high speeds they're operating at. And with the big motors, they'll have a lot of noise. If any of you have been around the center you've experienced that firsthand. Uh, the plus side though, they, they produce high cake solids and have a high capture rate. Pretty low wash water usage. Uh, we've got the smallest footprint of the technology we're looking at today. So the, the buildings you have to put them in are smaller and they are enclosed, so you don't have to worry about housekeeping issues and all your uh, they're clean and the odor of the uh, Screw press, got some other <coughs> slides coming up that'll dissect the machine. Uh, it generally looks like this with a small drive, basically with one moving part down the center of it, there's a screw that's uh, keeping the material through the machine. From a pro and con standpoint, the cons, screw press will generally use a uh, a lot of polymer like a centrifuge. Uh, they've got a medium footprint. It's larger than a centrifuge, but it's smaller than a bell filter press. The capture is not as high as a centrifuge, but it's still over 95% capture for your filtrate. And on the plus side, you've got extremely low power usage. The largest machines using 10 horsepower or less. Uh, lowest maintenance costs. That's a big number there. Less than, because of how slow the machine operates and how few parts there are, in general, budget less than 3% of the initial equipment cost for maintenance. Uh, the cake solids you're going to generate out of a screw press are similar to a centrifuge. They'll have the lowest wash water usage. They're, they're quiet, there's almost no noise. You can't hardly tell they're running because most units are going to have 3 horsepower, maybe 5 horsepower driving them. Uh, again, there's, it's an enclosed technology, so it's clean, there's no odors that can escape from the machine, and they are uh, extremely easy to operate. Here's a schematic showing up 
typical of the watering system, all the equipment on this side of the screen is going to be the same as what you'd have from a belt filter press or a centrifuge with a polymer prep system and sludge feed pump. Those are getting blended together in a flocculation tank, being fed through the screw press. Uh, and maybe in the back of stuff you see, but the, the screen pore sizes get smaller as you move through the machine. So when you first enter the machine, you're going to be thickening. Um, and as you move towards down the, the length of the machine, you'll start to watering. On the tail end of it, there's a uh, pneumatic cylinder that are holding a, a discharge cone, creating back pressure on the machine. So the slug cake has to get forced out to help uh, get some additional compression and increase the cake solids. You see here that the shaft of the screw is increasing. So as the water is being displaced, the shaft is getting bigger. So it's taking up some more of the volume and they're helping to create more, more pressure. And then also on the, on the tips of the flights here, we'll see some pictures coming up, there's a rubber lip. So there's, there's an impression fit between the auger and the screen itself. And that also helps prevent material from slipping back in the machine and help you generate higher pressure and generate higher cake size. So looking at some of the components, the, uh, the clock tank, not a lot of mystery to this. The sludge is being fed in from the bottom coming out, being fed out the top into the, into the screw press, some baffles inside of the tank, running the mixture shaft, and plugging the material up with the slug up with the polymer. And then a uh, blow apart view of the machine. Here the, uh, the slug is coming in from the right side and being discharged off the left side. You can see the discharge cone is where the, the Sludge has to overcome that pressure of that discharge cone to drop out the, uh, the outlet at the bottom. The cage here is split. So each of these sections is where the screen is. So the screen is a flat piece of steel that's punched, and then it's machined smooth and then rolled to fit into this cage. And to, to minimize the building, your footprint, there's two flanges here. These two halves are bolted together. So to do any maintenance on this auger, you don't have to have another 12 or 14 feet on the back of the machine to pull the auger out. You can just take the shroud off the top, split the cage, pick it out, and you can replace that rubber lip seal or do anything you want just right in place. You don't have to build a big building. The wash cycle is just run. It's not necessary for operation, but just for housekeeping. So at the end of an eight hour day, this is run on a linear actuator right here down the machine. This hoop is, and it slides over the top of that cage spraying the inside and spraying the outside of the machine just to clean up any of the, uh, the sludge cake that may have come through the screens. From a performance standpoint, for aerobic and digested sludges, you could expect 18 to 25 percent, then anaerobic in the 25 to 32 percent range as a, as a ballpark. So getting away from the graphics, here's what a machine actually looks like. The, the flock tank here on the back side of this machine sludge will be fed in. You see the cage here with the auger in the center of it. Uh, the linear actuator here, this pneumatically actuator that will run the cleaning cycle down the back, the discharge, and extraction screw sitting here at the bottom, and then your, here's your drain for your filtrate. So all the, all the filtrate comes out to the screen in a catch basin, then off on a, on a drain. We talked about this a little bit already, a closer up view. Uh, the cage is split, which helps minimize the footprint. On different screws, and then on the bigger machines, it's the, even the cage itself is segmented into quadrants. So you can take off the top right, top left. And it, as I mentioned before, the interior of the screen is machined for tolerance. There's other technologies that have been around uh, longer created this that were using uh, wedge wires. And the wedge wire, we have a slide we have showing that. that the manufacturing process, the larger the diameter gets, the more out of round they become. And where that, why that's important is that on, on the smaller machine where you can have your tighter tolerances, you'll have good performance from the machine, but as that machine, the diameter gets bigger and it gets out of round, you're going to see maybe a three to five percent you're going to lose on your cake solids, uh, just because of your, the, the brushes that are cleaning that aren't going to be able to, aren't going to be contacting, you're not going to generate as much pressure towards the discharge, and you're not going to clean the, the filter screen. Where with a machined screen like this, you can expect the same performance from the smallest 200 millimeter diameter machine to the largest 1.2 meter diameter machine. Uh, 
and then the, the wash cycle ring, when that moves, the, the screen here is stationary. There's just an auger down the center that's moving, and then so that hoop then comes down over the outside of that cage to clean the, uh, clean the machine at the end of the day. Uh, okay, here's the, uh, the wedge wire design. So each of these rings of that wedge wire is what we're looking at right here. And so you have a, the tapered shape on the outside. So any of the pieces that would pass through here, they won't get hung up in the remainder of that wire. Uh, you've got this gap for your fluid to flow through, but the product can plug the, uh, the gap there, which is why they use brushes to try and, and, and sweep it. Uh, but again, as the diameter gets larger, you've got imperfections in that, and so now maybe your brushes aren't going to hit that gap and, and keep it clean. And so as a result of that, they have to wash two or three times an hour to, uh, to clean, to back push that, that wedge water. Uh, when that happens, now you have to suspend your dewatering, you have to relieve the pressure in there that your, your screw was generating, back off the pressure, and then you can uh, flush out the wedge wire. So you're going to do water over the course of an hour, maybe you're only going to water for 45 or 50 minutes because you had to stop a couple times uh, to wash, where with the, the screen design, you just keep going for the full, full hour. And then also with the wedge wire, you can't, there's no place to split those screens like you can with the, uh, with the cage, so you need a larger footprint. You need that 15 feet of space in the back of the machine to pull, pull the screw to replace the brushes if you need to. This might be tough to see in the back, but here's some photos of the, the screens as the pore sizes get smaller as you go down the length of the machine. So here you can see the, the opening. In fact, you can even see a little bit of the, uh, the auger on the inside. And uh, the pore sizes get smaller on the, uh, the, the watering section. Now, the other there's other screen technology out there, but if you get a chance to look at the screen, you'll see that there's about half as many openings, pore openings in that. Uh, screen, which means they've got about half as much effect as the water here and for the water to escape. So by increasing the density of the pore openings in the screen, you're going to increase your throughput in the same uh, footprint size machine. So you can water more with a smaller machine than you can with the older technology which has a, a, less, a smaller pore density. And we talked about the, the High performance design doesn't have to suspend the watering. You just wash once per day. The wedge wire designs two or three times per hour to suspend the watering. So if you're going to size a screw press, you don't want to size for a gallon per minute, right? You want to size for a gallon per hour so you can capture that wash cycle in your design. Photo showing the, uh, the auger. You can see the tapered shape. So as it go down the length of the machine, that's getting a larger diameter. To, take up the space inside the machine to help generate pressure. And you can also see the, uh, the lip seal here held in place by these backer bars. So that's just acting as a squeegee on the inside of that screen. So with the wedge wire design, they're using a brush that you have on your, um, using this morning to brush off your windshield. And the other screen design, they don't have a lip seal. They just have a, the stainless steel flighting there. And it leaves a little bit of a gap between the between the flight auger itself and the screen, which doesn't allow them to generate as much pressure on the discharge area, so the material can slip back around the augers. Yeah, uh, lower quality filtering, you can't generate as high take solids. Uh, the expected wear life of that rubber lift is 4,000 to 6,000 hours, and depending on the size of the machine, the replacement is about 1,000 bucks. On the discharge, there's the UHMW lip on the discharge, which is also a wear part. 6,000, 8,000 hours for it, and it's uh, the pressure generated from a little air compressor with putting uh, with some pneumatic cylinders of, to hold the, hold the seal. There you go, Mike, you can hit the... So here's taking discharge from the machine. The normal operating speed is only a half an RPM. The maximum speed is one RPM. So you can imagine what really one moving part and it's only running at a half an RPM. So not a lot to do from a maintenance standpoint. And it might be actually a wash cycle. We said we're not uh, we're not washing for operations or washing just for housekeeping. 
put down here a little video showing the uh, wash cycle. Again, that's just being actuated by a, li a pneumatic actuator, a linear actuator on the top of the machine here. And you can see as it passes through, the machine is filled with water, and you can see water squirting out on the, the screens in the back side here as it passes by. So you just run this once again a day to clean out the uh, inside of the housing. Uh, from a filtrate standpoint, as I mentioned, greater than 95% capture. If you're in a situation where you need to improve upon that, the high performance design will have two basin catch basins at the bottom of the uh, machine. The filtrate on the initial thickening area will be a higher quality, and you can take that as your filtrate, and then on the, the back half of the machine where you have the water, you can have a little higher solids content coming out. You could alternatively recycle that and send that back to the clock tank, your sludge pump, and just run that through a second time. So very small flow at that point. Exciting video here showing a filtrate sample being collected. I know they talk about on the, uh, the throughput design for half an RPM and that gives you the ability to greatly increase your, your throughput through the machine. So you have a what weather event or you get long weekend you want to catch up on a, on a Tuesday you're coming in you can wind it up from a half an RPM to one RPM double your throughput and your only sacrifice then is a little bit of your cake solid you might have a three percent to five percent wetter cake coming out of the machine but you've got the ability to, to uh, catch up and, and really boost your throughput if you need to. Alright so to compare high performance versus traditional screw presses when you're watering dry solid standpoint, the high performance has a higher wedge wire and lower screen, the screens without the, uh, the lip seals are in the middle. Uh, the filtrate quality again higher, lower with the wedge wire in the middle of the screen. Uh, the wash water usage is, is low because you're just doing it once for eight hour a day. The wedge wire is several times an hour. Uh, I'm not familiar enough with the, the, the screen technology here to uh, comment on those. Uh, washing during operations, yes you can wash during your operations in here, no you can't because you have to suspend the watering. The screen tolerances are tight here, loose here, and a little bit better there. And can you replace the screen? Yes, after 10-15 years you can replace the screens as they wear. Here, wedge wire you can't, you have to replace the whole basket. And here again you can, you can replace them. Uh, because there's a quite a bit of variability between the model sizes with the other technologies rather than just specifying the machine everybody has a depth pilot unit to just recommend doing a demo and I recommend doing using a demo that's of similar size to what you would need in your plant it's because of it. if somebody comes out with a little 200 or 300 millimeter machine and you need a 700 or 800 millimeter well you'll have different performance um, with that bigger machine than you would with a little little pilot unit uh, Mike you can click on that image right there Or if you do do the demo with a smaller machine, when you write your specs, just require a performance bond, a performance guarantee as part of the specification, so they guarantee the same performance with the big machine as they did with the little pilot that they had. screw press turns on and in this case their screw conveyors would also turn on to handle handle our tape. 
If you had a pump as part of the system, that would be interlocked with a level sensor. Have a little hopper and catch your material when you get a high level si signal, then you just turn on your pump. Uh, from a daily shutdown standpoint, you just stop your feeds, and if you're going to shut down for just a day, you don't have to dewater your drain, your reaction tank, your fly tank. But if you're going to shut down for a few days, you can empty that reaction tank and you just run the wash cycle on the screw press. Uh, if you're going to shut down for more than a week, uh, and run the screw press, just bump it, just to rotate it on the bearings. And then if you were going to shut down for an extended period and you wanted to empty the machine so the material that goes septic on the inside, you just turn it on and let the conveyor auger all the, the cake out of the machine. From a maintenance standpoint, not a whole lot to do. You just grease the uh, drive and tail bearings. From an annual maintenance perspective, this discharge cone gives a little better view of it. You can see it's got the, a little bit of a wedge shape here for the material to slip past. That's a 6000 8000 hour uh, part. The lip seal, again, which you saw this picture, it's got these backer bars on it, so you take off the top shroud, take off the support cage, and then you just undo these bolts, take off the bars, and just thread a new piece on. So you're just taking your rotating machine a quarter of a turn and the time to thread a new one on. Uh, from a cost of ownership standpoint, comparing screw presses and centrifuges to belt presses, this is a hypothetical situation with roughly two truckloads of sludge cake produced a day. Uh, your initial capital investment looking at 315 for a screw press, about 230 for a centrifuge, and 250 for a belt press. Going back to the percent you'd spend on spares, earlier they placed a 3% here, 9400 bucks, 69000 37000 uh, your power usage, you can see 8 cents a kilowatt, the centerpiece would be quite a bit higher than the other technologies. Your cake disposal, the screw press would make 24%, centerpiece would make 25%, belt press at 19%, using $40 a cost per ton. That'll vary where, depending where you are in the country, but some big numbers here for the cake disposal of a landfill. And then your uh, polymer usage. The belt press is at the lowest, the centerpiece in the middle, and the screw press a little bit higher. So I end up with $114,95 and $47,000 a year in polymer. So if you add up all those operation and maintenance costs, your spares, power, cake, and polymer, you're spend $565, $600, for the screw press centrifuge and, and uh, belt filter press. The screw press is a 25 year life cycle. You're looking at about 13 years for a centrifuge and 15 for a belt press. So, in theory, you'd have some big numbers here for rebuilds or replacements in this 25 year life cycle, but just for this, this exercise, I'm leaving that blank. Uh, if you look at an 8% interest rate, the 25 year term, your present values for your uh, cost of ownership is the equipment 315 plus 764, total cost is 7.9 million, the centrifuge is 8.3 million. Bell press 8.9, so the screw press would be $380,000 less over its life, or a million less over its life over the bell press, not including the, uh, the reinvestment expense here from you know, the, the shorter life cycles of those, those technologies. One more video of uh, take discharge. It's a matter of what cake that's over 30% over solids. You certainly can land apply it. Absolutely. <laughs> as long as it passes the paint filter test, it's usually a requirement of landfill. So most people would just store it up in some sort of roof and haul it out. Yeah, so if it's you usually have a digestion process, you're reducing your volatile solids and make class B, and then like the state requires 180 days of storage, so people go like crazy in the spring and fall to land apply. Yeah. And you can hold it for, if you have the storage, you can hold it for. Oh, once a year, Paul? Sure. Oh, sure, sure. Uh, so the questions are regarding uh, storage of the material when land applying the material versus land filling. And say, the, the state has 180 days of storage, so most people are land applying in the spring and, and the fall. Uh, but yes, you could also 
land apply just in the fall. Yeah, the spring is not a good time to land apply to get around the storage. Right. And you can use either, like the brown cake, is that coming right out of a aerobic digester? Or you know, you show two, you show two, two videos, videos, right? And, and I, I don't know what the cake, what the process was in the plant that the, in, the, in the first video where it was coming out of the, the it was tube. Raw. Right. It wasn't black. Right. It looked like it was coming out of a, either a aerobic digester or an aeration digester. It hit that color. Right. You know how you most of them got set up. That, I don't know what that plant. Any other questions for Chuck? Again, these are made to go fairly quickly, and he did an excellent job. Uh, again, uh, what's your booth number? 219. 219. <laughs> I made them think there for a little bit. If you have more questions, that's how these are designed. Fall them back down to booth 219 and uh, carry on questions with them down there. Let's give them a round of applause, please.